of a new kind of collective intelligence. For instance, I think Google illustrates a very interesting new kind of intelligence. Now here, of course, I don't just mean Google the company. I mean the whole system of which Google is a part. Millions of people all over the world creating web pages, linking those web pages to each other. The Google technology that harvests all that knowledge so that when you type a question into the Google search bar, the answers you get often seem amazingly intelligent, at least in a certain sense of intelligence. And that's a kind of intelligence that never existed on our planet before. Another example, in some sense at the opposite extreme of technology, is Wikipedia. So here I think the really interesting innovation is not so much the technology, even though of course Wikipedia uses a very good uh, wiki software system. The real innovation with Wikipedia, I think, is the organization. Because Wikipedia has figured out a way to get thousands of people all over the world to create a very large and amazingly high quality intellectual product with almost no centralized control, and by the way, for free, since they're almost all volunteers. That, I think, is a truly amazing organizational invention. Now, we could go on and on. Other examples, Dig, YouTube, Innocentive, et cetera. These are all examples of new kinds of collective intelligence. And I think these examples are not the end of the story. I think they are just the beginning. I think we're likely to see hundreds or thousands more examples like this over the coming years. And what we need to do if we hope to predict what's going to happen, or especially if we hope to shape what's going to happen, we need to think more deeply about what's possible and how to take advantage of these possibilities. People are there in 2200. So how do you want to be remembered if you are the creator, the inventor, if you contribute something? What do you leave behind our disappearing bodies? What will you leave for them? It's a fundamental question I've been asking to myself and to my students because Doug. So Memento Mori is a message to think about futures. So today I talked about futures and uh, I really want to, I can't really thank enough to my hero, Doug Engelbart. Many other museums in the world, we have a representation of our institution in Second Life. And this is nothing new. Lots of people have done this before, but what we have done differently, and I think it's groundbreaking in the museum's world, uh, is that we put an empty museum in Second Life. We had no objects in there. And we ask visitors in Second Life to build exhibits, use their creativity to build exhibits. We internally from the Tech Museum approaching directly museum curators, museum designers around the world to build exhibits around subjects we define here at the Tech Museum. And that's our contribution or our part in collective intelligence. We do not want to rely anymore on our own staff to build exhibits out there on the floor. We have people working from all over the world, from Taiwan and from China, from Europe and from uh, Australia, on exhibits for the Tech Museum. We had a premiere about a couple months ago. Uh, I was very glad that Doug Inglebart was here as well for that party. Uh, we had picked from 250 teams which have worldwide contributed to Second Life. We've picked seven uh, exhibits we like most and where we figured out it's possible to convert them, to really build them for the real world. And we, our engineers here at the Tech, they copied these virtual ideas into the real world. And it's an exhibition exactly above us. But what we thought were Engelbart-centric 
products that shipped that helped define the historic landscape in which Engelbart's um, inc incredible contributions were developed. And this, so we put this in a body of water, and these are little uh, buoys. So we have Sketchpad and Steve Wozniak's Blue Box and Mosaic, etc. So I'm going to, um, so, but one of the things that was the driving theme of this and our life's work was that we really believed, and the more we worked with Doug and the deeper our understanding was, it was almost like working with Doug to understand his ideas was like peeling a cabbage. The layers were intertwined, they were ruffled, they were multicolored, and they just kept getting deeper and richer the farther we understood the vision. So one of the things that it seems like I'm going to make a call to action to all of you is that right now we're at the crossroads, and this group of people, each one of us, and all of us together, have the opportunity to really make a strategic evolution of collective consciousness to solve our urgent and complex problems. Our alternative is really extinction. So I'm making a call for you now to look at this mural. Look at the themes that jump out at you. Imagine the possibilities for change, for improvement, for collective problem solving probably clear to all of us even before we came today that new information technologies enable some dramatic new possibilities for collective intelligence. But in order to take advantage of these possibilities, we need to understand the distinct characteristics of different types of collective intelligence. And what I've tried to suggest today is that mapping the genes for the four basic questions of who, why, what, and how may be able to help us do that. Now, I could stop here, but before I end, I'd actually like to talk about one other possibility. As you know, when Doug talked about collective intelligence, he didn't just mean having companies that were smarter or, or uh, little organizations that were smarter. He talked about having the whole world be smarter. And in fact, if you think about our increasingly interconnected world with the internet symbolizing the, the level of interconnection that's now emerging, it's becoming clear that it's possible and in fact I believe increasingly useful to regard our whole species of all the humans on the planet as a kind of global brain which we can hopefully make to be a more intelligent global brain. One of my favorite ways of talking about this global brain comes from Kevin Kelly, who wrote in a 2005 article in Wired magazine. He said that there is only one time in the history of each planet when its inhabitants first wire up its innumerable parts to make one large machine. You and I are alive at this moment. Here at the cusp of the third millennium, humans began animating inert objects with tiny slivers of intelligence, connecting them into a global field and linking their own minds into a single thing. 3,000 years from now, this will be recognized as the largest, most complex, and most surprising event on the planet. It was the beginning. Thank you all very much.